imagine that you are one of Jesus' disciples, that you are one of his closest friends when he walked here on earth. You remember how he called you by name. You remember the gentleness in his eyes, the friendliness in his heart, the power in his words. You knew that there was far more ahead of you with him than what you were leaving behind. So you dropped everything to follow. Imagine then following him to a synagogue when a man approaches you and he's possessed by demons. And Jesus, by his command, the demons flee. Imagine cowering away as you watch a man with leprosy approach Jesus. And yet Jesus, with pity, goes towards him, reaches out his hand, and heals the man. Imagine holding your breath as the woman before you is sentenced to death by stones. And yet Jesus, with authority, steps in, forgives her, and sets her free. Imagine following him to a robber's home and marveling at how the man's life and the entirety of his heart is changed by Jesus' kindness and not by shame. Imagine pleading with Jesus to send hungry crowds away, and yet he feeds 5,000 of them by the offering of a small lunch. Imagine being trapped on a boat in a treacherous storm moments from death. You look over and Jesus is sleeping. And yet when he rises, he commands the wind and the wave to cease. Imagine day after day sitting at the feet of Jesus as he teaches about this kingdom, this kingdom where the least is the greatest. The mourning will be comforted. The poor will receive good news. The outcast will be sought after. The prisoner set free. The light overcomes darkness. And where the love of God and the love of neighbor is at the core of it all. Imagining, imagine, then following him to the tomb of his dear friend, seeing Jesus overcome with sorrow and weeping, and yet turns and rises to call the man back to life. Imagine for three years walking with Jesus on earth, marveling at his wonders and at his miracles, and not only that, but enjoying the deep love and safety of his friendship. Then imagine when he tells you that he is leaving. Imagine the questions. Imagine the despair that, that for the first time in your life you had this hope. You had this hope that there was so much more to your life that you could imagine, that, that you would resolve that for the rest of your life that you would follow him. And then he tells you that he's leaving. Imagine the questions. Jesus, why would you leave with so much unfinished work? Jesus, why would, why would you leave? You, you've proven to us that you're the son of God. Go show everyone that you're the son of God so they can believe you too. Or from that intimate place, Jesus, I only want to be with you. Why can't I come where you're going? These were just a few of the types of questions that the disciples had when Jesus told them. And in the midst of their confusion and their, and their distress, Jesus reminds them that, hey, this was, this was the plan. This was the plan. These were the prophecies about me, that I would go, I would die on a cross to offer forgiveness of sin, to make a way of salvation for all people, and I will rise again. But after I appear, I will not stay with you for very long, because it is for me to go to be with the Father in heaven. And yet he said that this, him leaving to go be with the Father, would actually be better for them than him staying. And this is the truth that I want us to not just hear this morning, but actually grapple with. That this truth for the disciples is actually the same truth in the promise for us. My hope is that in the same way that our minds were blown at imagining what it would be like to follow Jesus on earth, that over the next several weeks, our minds would be blown even more by what it can look like for us to follow him now that he's in heaven. And we get our first glimpse of this in Jesus' words that we're about to read. 
After Jesus had told them that he was leaving, he comforted them and he inspired them with two promises. And I want us like the disciples in this moment, you guys have probably heard these passages before, but just take yourself to that place with the disciples and to lean in with anticipation to these two promises. He said, I'm leaving, but I'm, I'm giving you this. So join me in turning um, to John 14. This is the first promise that he made to his disciples. This is John 14, verse 1. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. And just stopping there, it's like, how wonderful is it just to hear, just to hear Jesus say that? I'm like, can we just tattoo that on my eyeballs? <laughs> don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me wherever I am. Do you guys see the beauty of Jesus' heart here? That more than anything, his ultimate aim is just to be with us. He says that I am going to put together a room for you in my own home, just for you, in my house. And we know that, that heaven, that, that this, this place that we have secured for us in the future, that in this place there is no more death, there is no more sorrow, there is no more pain. And not only that, but we will be living in perfect unity with God, seeing him face to face, in perfect unity with people all over the earth of every generation, of every tongue, tribe, and nation who know Jesus. We have a secure future with him in heaven. And this is insanely incredible news, and none of this is by our merit. It is solely by his love and by his grace. But not only that, if you jump down to verse 12, he gives us a second promise. And this one is not for our future, but this is our promise for our lives today, our lives for right now. He says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. He says, all these works that we talked about and, and so many more that you've seen me do prove that I am the Son of God. And he says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. Whatever, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, and the, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. And the first time I read this or, or came back to reading this, I was just like stopped in my tracks. <laughs> that Jesus said, look at these works I've done. G you will do the same works and even greater than these. And I was like, is Jesus even allowed to say that? Is he allowed to say that? What, what does that even mean? How have, I, how have we missed this? But the first and most important question is how. How is this even possible? Immediately after he explains, this is verse 15, he says, if you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Jesus promises that we will do greater works because he is leaving and giving us the Holy Spirit. For most of us, and I think, I think the church at large in the U.S., puts all of our weight and our faith in the first promise. And yes, yes, that is like the best news that the world has ever heard, that we have a secure, eternal future in heaven with Jesus, and it is nothing to do with us but purely his own sacrifice. But what if, you guys, that the second promise is also the best news the world has ever heard? The good news that the kingdom of heaven that Jesus started is still growing today. That these miracles of healing and provision, this radical love of neighbor, the overturning of power and systems for the sake of the oppressed, the setting free of sin, the raising of the dead, the total transformation, 
transformation of life did not end at the cross. That in fact, greater things have happened after the cross because he has made a way of salvation for all people. And by going to the Father, he left us with the Holy Spirit to continue his mission on earth. He said, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. And I just want to clarify for us a little bit because I had this question in my head too that greater does not necessarily mean that for each of our individual lives we will do more physically miraculous things than Jesus. Like I wouldn't expect the next time you go to Kalahari to be walking on water. <laughs> but, but we do see the apostles, if you read Acts 2, do physically insane miraculous miracles. There's, there's things happening all over the world right now. So I don't, I don't want that to like diminish your faith or put this in a box. I just want to clarify it a little bit, but that greater works means for us collectively that now the gospel and the kingdom have a greater capacity to move through the earth for more and more people to come into friendship with Jesus. Because now God's love and God's power is not just in one person, but it's in people, the body of Christ. And I wonder how many of us, like absolutely myself included, have forgotten this, ignored it, maybe never really heard it, underestimated the significance of this in our lives today. That we've wholeheartedly received the good news for our future life, but perhaps our current life, we haven't fully received it. Either we live with, with this hope and thanksgiving, but right now is, is not much more than being a good person, pursuing success at work, um, making sure our biceps are swole when we get to the pearly gates, which nothing is, nothing is wrong, Aaron. Nothing is wrong with these things in and of themselves, but if that's it, you guys, we have missed it. We've missed it. Or are we really digging in to try to live like Jesus, but, but we're burnt out on doing it on our own strength? We're discouraged by our own, our own sin. Or perhaps we're living in a place of desperation, wondering if this life really even has any significance. Or you're in a place of deep need for liberation, for healing, but cannot find any hope. Or you've been feeling abandoned and alone. For each of these places and so many unmentioned, Jesus give us, gives us the good news of our lives today that in your circumstances, in your place with your people, that God has made his home with you here. And that there is more life, there is more hope available to you than you can imagine because he has given us his Holy Spirit. And before we get into this, into this life with the Holy Spirit, it's important that we take a pause and talk about and discover who the Holy Spirit is. So going back to verse 16, he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. And first I want to point out, it seems small, but notice that it says, verse 17, it says, He is the Holy Spirit, not it. The Holy Spirit, He's a person. He's not a force. He's not some thing that we have to figure out a formula for. He's not something that you press all the right buttons and you activate it. The Holy Spirit is a person. And so you don't activate it, you relate. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, he knows you. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, he has emotions. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, he has good plans for you. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, you can talk to him plainly. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, he loves you. And this should be a relief to us because each one of us knows how to relate to other people. But the good news is that Jesus is not a normal person and he doesn't care how socially awkward we are. 
Amen. <laughs> Jesus in the Holy Spirit. He is divine in nature. To be in relationship to the Holy Spirit is to be in relationship with this triune God, which appropriately will bring some mystery to this relationship because, because again, he's not a human. He is eternal. He is all-knowing. He was there at creation. So while we are in awe of him, of, we're all of his divine nature, we can put our trust in him because of his character. Because he is the exact same, this exact same Jesus we read about and marvel at and are just moved by his love, his compassion. He's of the exact same nature with you. And if this is your first time in church or even just like me, this concept of this triune God feels confusing. There is. There is a lot of mystery to it. But the Bible teaches us of this triune God where it's three persons in one. We have the Father, the Son, who is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And many a youth leader in my life have tried to explain this with different illustrations. <laughs> Some have used H2O where it's like water, ice, clouds, um, eggs where it's, you know, the yolk, the egg white, the shell. I've even seen one that was banana where if you peel a banana, you have three separate <laughs> peels. You know, they try. God bless youth leaders, am I right? <laughs> but it's three persons, but they are all in one of the same mind, of the same love, of the same character, and they move in different roles throughout the world and in history. And, and there's so much mystery to it, but I think, I think what we can get from this is, is a beautiful truth that God is an inherently relational God. And to be in friendship with the Holy Spirit is to be in friendship with the entirety of, of these three holy persons who have made their home with us today. And not only unity with them, but unity with everyone else who knows him. And the Holy Spirit is not the lesser of the three. So sometimes, even though sometimes we talk about him that way. When Jesus says in verse 16, he says, the Father will give you another advocate. It does not mean a lesser version. And I know we pick on grocery pickup a lot today, but has anybody, they are doing the Lord's work. They're absolutely doing the Lord's work. But has anyone had it where they'll like replace it with a similar item? Yes. <laughs> there was one morning where I was like pumped about this broccoli quiche I was going to make, and I ordered frozen broccoli, which they happened to be out of stock of, so they gave me frozen corn. <laughs> and let me just say that nothing will humble you or illuminate your need for Jesus than how you respond to minor inconveniences. <laughs> I gave five stars, but I, I know I sinned in my heart, though. But <laughs> bye bye <laughs> By another, by this word another, he doesn't mean a different option. He means one exactly like the first. The Father gave us Jesus, then the Father gave us the Holy Spirit. The same love for you, the same compassion, the same power. And in the same way that there are so many names for Jesus throughout the Bible, just in this one verse, if you study the different translations, there are so many different names for the Holy Spirit that can reveal so much about who this friend is to us. One translation, the one we read, says an advocate. An advocate is someone who pleads your case, someone who's always working for your good. Another translation says a counselor. Someone who gives you insight, direction, reminds you of what is true, shows you how to walk in it. A helper. Someone who enters into your mess with you and helps you do things that you could never do on your own. A comforter. Someone holds you in peace, holds you in love, and holds you in compassion. A redeemer. Someone who delivers from sin. And if you love and if you believe in Jesus, you've been given the gift of an advocate, a counselor, a helper, a comforter, a redeemer who is with you always. But it's even better. As, as awesome as it is to imagine like this, this posse of all these people walking with you, helping you in your life, know that it is even better because he is a divine God and he does this on a supernatural level. So not only do you have an advocate, 
you have a supernatural advocate. Where in Romans, he says that he is the one who seals our identity, that he testifies to our own spirit, that he reminds our own spirit that we are children of God, which leads you to a place of intimacy with the Father. Not only do we have a counselor, but we have a supernatural counselor. And John, he says, he will lead us into all truth. He will teach us all things. He will remember. He will help us remember God's word. And as I walk at the Holy Spirit, I have to say, like, I marvel so often. All right? I marvel at how often he really does bring scripture to mind. Because it's, it's like when someone mentions a book, and I'm sure you guys can relate, you're like, oh, I love that one. Like, yeah, what's it about? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Or like, even for me, I was obsessed with Twilight. And if someone like tried to bring up a plot point, like, you remember that part? The only part I remember is they named their kid Renesmee at the end. I was like, that is weird. But I'm telling you guys, this thing is real. There are stories from my childhood that I've only heard once that I remember today. There are scriptures I perhaps have only read once that he brings them to remember. This is real. Not only do we have a helper, we have a supernatural helper. In Ephesians, he says he provides strength and power to our inner being to help us understand the depth and the breadth of God's love. And not only does the Holy Spirit pour love straight into our hearts, he pours Jesus' life straight into our bodies. In Romans, it says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead gives life to your mortal body. And I recently heard this quote by by the late Rachel Held Evans that said, God is not a God of self-improvement. God is a God of death and resurrection. This supernatural helper is not here to help you be a better person. He is to give you new life. Not only do we have a comforter, we have a supernatural comforter, which this one, like, gets me. This is Romans. He says, when we don't know what to pray for, you have a Holy Spirit with you who prays for you with wordless groans. Not only do we have a redeemer, we have a supernatural redeemer who convicts us of sin and as we walk with him sets us free. And not only does he set us free from sin, but he fills us with fruit. Fruit that Galatians says, as we walk in him, the Holy Spirit grows us in love. He grows us in joy, in peace, in patience, in kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. As we walk with the Spirit, Jesus, he makes us look more like Jesus. Imagine the most joy-filled version of you. That looks like Jesus. Imagine the most love-filled version of you. That looks like Jesus. The fruit of walking with the Holy Spirit is that we look more and more like Jesus. Scripture is full. This is all just from one, exploring one verse. <laughs> Scripture is full of the ways that the Holy Spirit supernaturally works for our good and God's glory. This is why that Jesus says the gift of the Holy Spirit is actually better than us walking with Jesus physically on earth. As I heard a pastor phrase it, he said, before Jesus left, we could only be in the presence of God. But now we have God's presence in us. Verse 17, he says, you know him. He lives with you now and later will be in you. Jesus said, just like you know what it's like to walk with me now on earth, I will be in you. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you here to figure it out, to fend for yourself. You don't have to just hang on until heaven by yourself. I will be with you. I have not left you as an orphan. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Because I live, Jesus says, you also will live. Because of the cross, Because he is alive and because of the Holy Spirit, his resurrection can be our resurrection. His power can be our power. His joy can be our joy. His love is our love. His peace is our peace. 
His freedom is our freedom. His mission is our mission. His works are our works. And greater works than these. Because he left and gave us the Holy Spirit. Because I live, you also will live. When Jesus left earth, he didn't abandon us. He didn't abandon his work. He is here and his work continues because of the Holy Spirit in us. Because of the resurrection, the door has been opened wide for us to imagine a world, to imagine relationships, to imagine a life that is far different than the one that we know. To imagine a world like the one that Jesus taught us to ask for, where his kingdom comes, God's will is done, and it's on earth like it is in heaven. And it is through the Holy Spirit that no longer are we just witnesses to the work of God, but we get to participate in the work of God. The band can come on up. So, Ms. City, I have to tell you that we, we entered into this conversation not by our own plan. Sammy, Sammy had invited me in, and we were planning a completely different series, and yet we felt this sense that God wanted to do something um, just through prayers and conversations. I, I even had a dream. And we don't know what he has plans for us, but we, we know him. And so we're trusting that it's going to be incredible that he's going to do more than we can ask or imagine. That, that the same God who split the seas to rescue his people that provided for manna in heaven that came on earth in Bethlehem, who walked among his people, who died and rose again, is with us. But as I was praying on how to land this conversation, where to like take us next, how we even like respond to all of this, I turned and I, I prayed for our church and I waited. And guys, I just felt this deep sense that God wants each one of us to know how much he loves us. And I believe he brought me to this passage that I'm going to read, read over us in a little bit. But not only that, he brought me back to a moment um, that was so vivid in my mind that I want to share with you today. And I think it'll give us some perspective um, on a more intimate level. And that moment was I, when I was um, a mom to a six-week-old baby girl just in the thick of postpartum and caretaking and like I did every day, I went over to her crib to wake her up from her nap. But this time it was different. Because this time when I walked over and I, I peered over the rails, she was smiling at me for the very first time. And I wept, not just because I was like mega hormonal or it was so cute. I, I wept because something in that moment, it gave me a new perspective. And, and it, her smile was saying so much more. Her smile told me that finally she recognized, after what felt like a lifetime, oh, it's you. You're the one who loves me. It's you. You're the one who made me. You're the one whose heartbeat I heard when I was in darkness. You're the one whose voice sang over me and prayed for me when I couldn't yet see your face. You're the one who, for the joy set before you, you laid your body down to be cut so that I could have life. You're the one who's been holding me every day since. You're the one who's been holding me when I cry. You're the one who's been providing for my every need. You're the one who can't help but cry every time I look at you because you just think I'm so precious. You're the one who held my hand at the doctors. You're the one who's been carrying me. You're the one who's been laying me on my tummy to help me get stronger. You're the one who's been up with me in the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep. You're the one who has sacrificed everything for me. You're the one who loves me. It's you. You guys see what I'm getting at? The picture I'm painting? Is it not with the Holy Spirit in us? Listen, guys, listen. Guys, as we're anticipating a movement of God, I feel like the starting point for us is to recognize, like my daughter did, that God, God's love for us in a new way, or perhaps for the first time. To turn our eyes to him and say, it's you. 
you're the one who loves me. And understand this, had she never smiled at me or ever acknowledged me in her life, I would have loved her completely the same because I couldn't love her anymore. I didn't love her because she acknowledged me. I loved her because she was mine. But when she smiled at me, when she recognized, oh, it's you, you love me, something did change. And it was our relationship. Because she, because I know, because she knows I love her, she trusts me. Because she knows I love her, she runs to me without hesitation when she's scared or hurt. Because she knows I love her, she feels freedom in my presence and we share so much joy together. Because she knows I love her, she goes wherever I go because she knows I have good plans for her. Because she knows I love her, she obeys me most of the time. (laughs) Because she knows I love her, she feels peace and she believes me when I kiss her head or I put my hand on her chest and tell her not to worry. Yes, we want to be captivated by Jesus' words and this vision that he paints for us, for his church, by his invitation to do even greater works. We want to step into these impossibilities. We want to see our church come alive. We want to see our city transformed, but we can have no part of this. We, we learn this during the neighbor series, unless it is love, and that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit of God is to be filled with his love, because God is love. Thus, everything he does in love and everything we do ought to be done in love. And we know that we love because he first loved us. And so I'm going to pray over us a prayer that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And I'm going to invite us, guys, to kneel. If you are able, in order to posture yourself in solidarity with these words. And this and kneeling is not some performative thing. If we believe that the Holy Spirit has take, taken residence in our bodies, then we have to believe that there's power with what we do in our bodies. Kneeling puts us in a posture of surrender, of reverence. So how much more when we align our hearts and our bodies? And if you're new to Soma City or new to Jesus, just know, like we always say, you guys have a pass. But we would love for you to join us if you feel led. And I also want to say that you don't have to get on your knees. That doesn't, you don't have to be a super church person. That actually, this was a very normal response for new followers and longtime followers of Jesus to respond to him this way. So if you guys are able to kneel, I want to pray this over us this morning. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.